Greetings. This presentation covers Epicor Eclipse ERP, Byline, and Procure Group Maintenance. Bylines group products together to apply purchasing controls and uh, the sources that you're buying the products from. Uh, products can also have a secondary byline. Uh, this would be a sign for commodity items where you might have s multiple and irregular suppliers. Um, this is not done very often, but it's a, a function that's in there at least. Here's an example listing of the bylines and price lines that we use in our system. And as mentioned before in the presentation on price line maintenance, these are mostly derived from the trade service catalog or I think the IDW uh, in the uh, manufacturer field or brand field. And for vendors that uh, do not publish the catalogs, well, we make our best guess on what it should be, try and make it unique and consistent with the others. And here's just the continuation of that list from a previous slide. When you set up a byline, you also have to specify the procure group that's involved. And uh, the procure group controls the way the byline items are replenished and uh, procured. Uh, the procure groups can control the ability uh, to buy uh, the transfer flow from branch to branch and the preferred vendors. So much of the logic that's in the uh, byline is actually being controlled from the procurement group that's attached to the byline. So of course we have to go into procurement group maintenance and explain some of these settings in here. Uh, first off, only multi-branch distributors would need pure procurement groups because so much of the logic is dealing with the, uh, the flow and purchasing of materials uh, from branches. Uh, so if you only got one, don't need all that logic. Uh, the normal arrangement is to have a single parent branch that normally resupplies all the child branches for that region, uh, but there are literally an untold number of varieties of ways that you can uh, handle and manage that. You could have multiple parents, you could have all branches equal transferring to each other regardless of location, uh, just about any crazy combination you can come up with. Um, the point of all this is is that you can really uh, control the flow of your materials and and who's doing the purchasing uh, so that um, a, a location that's selling materials may not physically house any of the materials or they may physically house materials but they're not allowed to do any purchasing or perhaps they're only allowed to do purchasing of particular lines of products uh, as an as-needed basis and commodities may be purchased from the central warehouse to uh, be able to uh, manage the freight charges better and move things back and forth. There's all kinds of reasons. Okay, so our first setting to look at is the warehouse and buy branch setting. And what we're dealing with here is, of course, what location physically stores the materials that are being sold uh, for this location specified what location is allowed to buy the product lines that are sold from this location. And here we we have an example of a two-branch company, obviously mine. Um, and for branch one, you can see for the branch one sales location, uh, branch one is also the warehouse for warehousing the materials that are going to be sold for that location, and they also have the ability to purchase the materials for that location uh, once it's applied to this particular buy line. And vice versa also with branch 2. Transfer branches. What locations are allowed to transfer materials to supply the other branches? And this is normally planned out according to physical proximity from one branch to another. Uh, for obvious reasons, you don't want to spend two days truck driving things in between states that don't matter. Um, there can be multiple transfer branches defined. Since I'm dealing with only a two-branch company, I can't show multiple examples, but you know, if I had a five-branch company, I could list all five branches here to transfer back and forth to each other. And uh, so here we have in our example that uh, for our two-branch company that both branch one and branch two warehouses are allowed to transfer the materials uh, that these bylines are going to have this procure group assigned to between each other. The vendor selection is used to create a list of vendors to use in emergency situations. Uh, possibly a regularly supplying vendor uh, when you have several days that uh, you can kill for the shipment to show up. 
but if you need something like right now or in a day or so, you might have a different vendor that you that you pick from or a group of them in emergencies because you can select multiple. Um, in most cases, at least in my company, we don't specify an exact uh, emergency vendor. We trust our purchasing agent to know this stuff, so we uh, put in there, buyer please locate, uh, which is go find whoever is best and got it on the shelf and get it, get it in people's hands as quick as possible. Um, the buyer please locate selection is actually a vendor record and vendor maintenance. Um, so of course when you when you go to fill out these uh, emergency procurement vendors, you have to have the vendors already created in vendor maintenance. Okay, so enough with procurement groups. Now uh, back to byline maintenance. And looking here under the file menu, I just wanted to mention this funny little selection that had me kind of befuddled for years uh, called Toggle Hierarchy. And uh, it sounds fancy. It sounds like it does something uh, really interesting and dangerous. And honestly, no, it doesn't. <laughs> just allows you to change the the view. Uh, when you normally go into byline maintenance, it's going to show all the branches and, and the basic settings on a list. And if you want to just uh, specify one branch at a time and look at just the settings applying to that one branch, you select toggle hierarchy and it allows you to do that. So mystery solved. It's not a big dangerous thing. As a general overview of byline maintenance, um, first off, there should be an entry for each branch in your company. Um, the buyer could be different for each branch. Um, in, in our case, we don't. We use the same buyer for both branches. Um, this is not a control. It's just, just a, a selection. Um, the buy target and type can be based on dollar amount, quantity, weight, load factor, which is physical size, or day supply. If you uh, select day supply, and uh, the great book of Eclipse mentions that when you first create a byline, it usually should be set to day supply, and that's because the system has not had a chance yet to accumulate any purchasing history and do any strategic calculations for you. So, so you're uh, putting in a manual originally until the system has a couple of months to uh, accumulate some data and then start doing intelligent decisions for you, which is hopefully why you spent so much money for the software in the first place. Um, so normally after you get through with that, uh, and the normal setting here you see on, this, on the second uh, window, is uh, to set it as a uh, dollar value. That is, and that's typical for most vendors that they want an order of so many hundreds or so many thousands of, of dollars before they'll ship, or uh, so many thousands of dollars uh, in order for the for them not to uh, charge you additional shipping costs. So target basis is where all the magic happens uh, for all the settings we were talking about on the previous slide. And as previously mentioned, uh, the target type is usually dollar amount, uh, or it might be day supply if it's fairly new, or if you want a tighter control and you don't want the system to automatically make the decisions for you. Uh, the discount field is uh, if the vendor gives you a certain percentage discount off the bill, uh, if you uh, reach a certain target for the, for the purchase. Um, my company doesn't have any of those, but you might, and if so, good luck to you. Isn't that wonderful? Um, the target basis defines what price basis is used for uh, the calculation, and uh, take a look at the presentation that I have on uh, price lines to explain uh, what a lot of these basis selections are going to to reference. Uh, there's a window over here I show on price line maintenance. If you looked at the presentation, this will jog your memory of what was in there. And uh, ordinarily, you're going to be probably using the basis of your last cost or your purchase price that you've loaded into the system. Uh, level 2 is used for secondary bylines. You can have multiple bylines uh, assigned to uh, a, a line, uh, but uh, I wouldn't suggest it. Anyway, we'll mention that later. The vendor selection is where we go ahead and specify the vendors that we're routinely going to buy from for this byline. And uh, this control is really kind of goofy. When you first pop up, you expect to have uh, 
uh, searchable drop-down list to enter things in. Y you can't do that. The control is goofy, so you actually have to do a file and insert branch, and then specify the branch, and then you got to go in and and uh, edit vendors and select the vendor and then OK and same thing with uh, the type. So the control is a little odd but as long as you just uh, select off that file drop down list you'll be fine. Uh, in types you of course have the options of line, emergency or both. Line is going to be your regular line by vendor uh, which is what you should be specifying here. Uh, the emergency, if you specify the emergency uh, procurement vendor here it's probably going to override the uh, vendor selection that you've specified for the procure group maintenance. So you may or may not want to do that. Uh, keep that in mind before you select in the emergency vendor. And now we're going to quickly cover the rarely or never used additional options that you can find in bylines. In additional data, the two most useful settings I can see here although keep in mind I've never changed them from the defaults in our system, is the uh, combine on central purchase order and that's used to combine branch orders to meet a target, uh, which could be handy, and a default non-stock template that you can specify. And This would be, um, you could obviously set the template with all the predefined common parameters that you'd want and when someone goes to create a new non-stock item for this byline then it'll pull the information from that template. So it helps you with consistency as a purchasing guy. You're not having to go and make so many corrections into new items being created. And other than that, I wouldn't use the other settings. The return policy is just a little handy tool to jog your memory when doing returns. And uh, you can put in the basic information like uh, the number of days from uh, the date of order that you can safely return it at, uh, wh where they'll accept it, and, of course, you can uh, go ahead and enter a, a simple uh, message comment uh, to give you more information on uh, what the vendor requires for uh, RGA. And uh, all this does is it uh, gives you a simple little view-only message that's going to display in the return goods verification window when you go to process a return. The freight factor allows you to kind of pre-calculate a a default amount of freight charges if you haven't uh, went ahead and defined them in the purchase order. Uh, this is a percentage of the total dollar value of the order. So in, in this case in our example if this was a $1,000 order it's going to automatically calculate a freight charge of 3% of $1,000 if you don't enter in a freight charge in the purchase order. The UET parameters, which stands for Unquality Event Tracking, how's that for not logic? Uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, this is a mechanism used to uh, for reporting for shipping delays or uh, something shipped too soon, and quantity overages or shortages. And uh, once you put these parameters in, then you can run reports, and the system could give you uh, some some idea of the accuracy of your uh, uh, vendors supplying you. Uh, sounds interesting, but odds are it's probably more complexity than it's worth. Probably gives you a lot of uh, misleading information, and like all these other uh, settings we're going through, I've never used it. The forecast parameters tool is used for demand forecasting of seasonal products. Uh, normally this would be done at a product level if you needed to do such a thing. Uh, I wouldn't apply it to an entire line. But, uh, you know, it really depends on how your system uh, is constructed and how you've constructed your bylines. Uh, I, I don't really see a use for it in electrical distribution because there aren't really any seasonal products I know of in electrical distribution, uh, but I might be obtuse. I suppose if you were using Eclipse for a feed and farm supply or some general hardware store, then you'd have a lot of seasonal products. But, uh, as I said, interesting, but I, I've never had uh, come across use for it. Hits and maximum day supply. Um, hits are the number of times you've sold something, not the number of items you've sold. So every every time you could do a sale and that product's in it, that would be considered a hit. Um, also, you have specified here branch hits, and uh, that is uh, when you do the calculation, how many number of hits you calculate uh, before the system decides that this is a stockable item at the branch level. 
uh, network hits that takes a look at all the hits in all of the branches in your company and when it hits that quantity it decides whether or not to make the product stockable uh, perhaps at your at your main uh, distribution warehouse uh, that supplies the others or possibly at all the branches and uh, your maximum day supplies that's uh, when you go to do a purchase order you know vendors being what vendors are they're always going to try and get you to buy a little bit more than what you what you needed um, this allows the the purchasing agent to have you know some creativity but uh, but uh, you can't go beyond uh, in this case 160 days uh, calculated supply of the product and that that uh, <laughs> if you got a purchasing agent that's a that got a bit of a weak spine <laughs> make sure he doesn't sell you down the river and buy 10 year supply of something the calculated values are exactly that the the average lead time, last time the buy line w was bought, uh, the last time a suggested PO was generated on the buy line. Uh, this is useful informational purposes, uh, I, I suppose, but this is not edible. The system is doing these calculations. This is just a view window. Super buy lines are, well, kind of exactly what you expect a super buy line to be. It is a buy line made of a bunch of buy lines tied together. Um, keep in mind if you decide to create one of these things you can't take an existing byline that's got products assigned to it and make it a super byline so you have to start a new one and uh, and add existing bylines to that um, I honestly can't think of a use of it but as with all things in Eclipse there's an option I'm sure somebody out there must have a need for it and the final installment in our not used or seldom used selection is the override lead time and this is <laughs> exactly what it sounds like it is. It's used to override the system calculated lead times. Um, I wouldn't suggest doing that, but eh, there it is. And this concludes our presentation on byline and procure group maintenance. Hopefully this has not been too painful for you, and maybe even useful. That would be nice. And as always, thank you for your attention. I am not Scott Zahn.